Hi, I'm Gene Delasala, President of Audioholics, and today we're here with... Hugo Rivera, Vice President of Marketing. Well, today I think we should go ahead and discuss the cable myth, because I've been reading a lot of articles over here saying a lot of things that really don't sound uh, very technically uh, correct to me, to be quite honest with you. That's a good topic, Hugo. You know, we spent probably the last decade or so debunking the myths and cables in this industry, and unfortunately this industry doesn't have many checks or balances, so we're kind of the police of it when it comes to wild-eyed myths, hence the pursuing the truth in, in audio Thank and video. You. Exactly. So anyways, uh, you know, it's an interesting topic that you want to discuss, and I think the reason why these myths exist is you're dealing with an industry where you've got audiophiles that are very passionate about sound, but they're not necessarily very technical people. Mm -hmm. They don't have electrical engineer degrees. Right. So, you know, you get these cable companies that like to prey on that fact. And what they do is they come up with what I call pseudoscience, which is based on regular science, at least the principles or the names of the problems they're trying to identify. But then they come up with these Looney Tune explanations on how they fix it and how this is a real problem for you to deal with. You know, being an engineer myself, I look at uh, some of the literature I've been reading and I say to myself, man, that doesn't even work on Star Trek, to be quite <laughs> honest with you. <laughs> it's like, you know, uh, the, the audio field is really, the non-technical audio field is really over there falling prey to a lot of the stuff because, you know, if you don't know anything about, about electrical engineering, some of it is like, okay, whatever, you know, there's no... Yeah, and the interesting thing about that is it, it, this seems to be more of a problem with consumer audio than pro audio, for example. Pro audio, you tend to get more of the technical people that are in recording studios or that are setting up for you know gigs. They don't fall victim to that because it's not tolerated. Mm -hmm. But in consumer audio, you're dealing with the average consumer that you know they just want good sound. Mm -hmm. They want the promise of good sound. Right. So they'll believe whatever the manufacturer is telling them because they sell a good story. Right. Exactly. You know what? Why don't you cover some of the uh, myth? that are out there because I've read some really incredible stuff. I mean, I've read cryogenic freezing the stuff. I mean, <laughs> the kind of things I'm reading, I'm like, I think about it and, you know, understanding material science and understanding all these engineering concepts, I say to myself, this is not right, you know? Yeah, can you shed yeah. some light on this stuff? I definitely can. I'll, I'll go over some of the common ones. There's a lot of them. If, if we really wanted to go over all of them, we'll be here for a half hour and I don't think people want to really yeah. be listening to us talking that long. So anyways, one of the most common ones that we've been debunking is the problem of skin effect in cables, in audio cables. And what skin effect basically is, is it's a measure of AC resistance, which is how the resistance increases in the cable as frequency mm -hmm. goes up. Mm -hmm. Because as frequency goes up, what happens is the current profile that goes through the cable becomes more dense towards the surface of the conductor doesn't go quite as deep, so the skin depth decreases. Understood. But this is a problem with RF. RF frequencies mm -hmm. in the megahertz and gigahertz range. This is really not an issue with audio. Yeah, basically what you're saying here is that this is a problem that is not applicable to frequencies that we can actually hear. You know? Or that even are being reproduced by your system. And when here comes to pseudoscience again. What these companies like to do is they say, well, you know, a typical cable has a skin effect problem. And what happens when the cable has skin effect? Well, if you're using a stranded cable, they claim the current jumps from one strand to the other, like it's some magical Disney thing. And when it jumps, it creates diode rectification or distortion. And now that's completely nonsensical because no piece of wire can introduce a nonlinear distortion. It's a passive device. So the skin effect thing, it's, it's, that's one of the biggest things that uh, these companies try to purport as being a problem. And they come up with elaborate designs to combat this. Some of them are good. Some of them where they take... I'll give you an example, like um, we've got this cable here from Kimber. This is a cr pretty cool cable. What it is, it's a, it's a braided cable, so they use very, low ga uh, very high gauge conductors, but a lot of them, to get the resistance down. And they braid them in such a way that it reduces inductance, because you're keeping the conductors relatively close together. Mm -hmm. And by doing that uh, braid, as opposed to sandwiching conductors flat on top of each other, you're keeping the capacitance pretty low. Okay. So there are some cables that have such high capacitance because they sandwich the connect conductors together that they have to actually put an RC network at the end of it so the amplifier doesn't oscillate. Mm. To me, that's not a good solution. Why do you want to put a device on an amplifier that can make the amplifier oscillate sure. or cause all sorts of problems or stability? Right. So this is a good approach 
from Kimber. And I also see over here that uh, it seems to make the connection pretty secure, no? Yeah, well, what I like about this cable, for example, is it's got a compression plug on it. This is a banana compression plug. I'm a big fan of these. I, I personally believe the most important thing on a cable, other than its resistance, is how well of a connection it can make at your speaker end and the amplifier end. The cool thing about this cable is you stick it into the amplifier of the speaker and then you twist it in, it expands, and you can't pull it out at all. I mean, it's very hard to pull out. Now, some audiophiles prefer to use spades. I don't like spades. It's kind of like a fork, mm -hmm. like that. Okay. What happens with spades is it's really hard to get, to get a, a stable connection, and if you, you can easily knock it off you the speaker off. when you're vacuuming. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's some other examples here. This is a very, very cost-effective solution to a compression banana plug. This is a company called Blue Jeans Cable. Standard 10 gauge zip, uh, zip cord, but it's got a compression plug. You screw it in place, and you see it expanding. And that's another firm connection okay. that I like. Looks very good. But back to the, um, the mitts. So we talked about skin effect and resistance mm -hmm. and the other mitts are, like you say, cryogenically free. <laughs> I read that, I'm like, okay, what, what are they talking about? I mean, because me, again, going back to my engineering, basic material science shows you that, yeah, um, you know, materials, when you go ahead and expand them or, or well, let's, let me go ahead and say this, uh, when you go ahead and heat them up, Yes. or you want to go ahead and change, you know, any temperature change, it's going to go ahead and, and have effects on the properties of the material. But when the temperature goes back to normal ambient room temperature, right. you know, you go back to those properties over there. So I, I would think that if you're freezing the cable and then defrosting it, <laughs> for lack of a better term, yes. uh, you're going to go back to square one, no? Yeah, that's exactly right. And uh, it's sad because some of these companies could charge you over $1,000 to take your cable Send it to a cryo lab. It's almost like they're preserving somebody's body or something. <laughs> they freeze it. They claim that it aligns the crystals of the copper in such a way that it's perfect. Again, reducing distortion, which doesn't exist. <laughs> and then they then they send you the cables all thawed out. <laughs> but people buy into it, man. You laugh, but there are people right now buying cryogenically frozen cables. And I'm here to tell you, you don't need to keep your t your cable temperature below room temperature. You just got a $1,000 seminar over here. This is going to save you $1,000, okay? Because if you listen to this garbage out there, I mean, <laughs> your wallet is certainly going to go ahead and take a hit, no? Yes, definitely. You, you lose some weight and, and come it, from the wallet. It gets is. worse, Hugo. There's a company particularly that likes to slap a battery on their cable. And they do it for all their cables. They don't just do it for speaker cables. They do it for their HDMI cables. And their theory is the dielectric of the cable is the problem. And the dielectric needs to be broken in, which again is another myth. You can't break in a cable. Uh, you know, a music signal is random in nature. So the idea of the cable somehow magically, again, the magical pixies from Disney are aligning to be ideal all the time, you know, is a bunch of BS. It so is. what this company does is they stick this battery, like a 72 volt battery, whatever. If they can make up whatever voltage they want. And they stick it between the dielectric and then they even tell you, well, it doesn't make a physical connection to the cable, so it's not conducting, so the battery lasts forever. Well, gee, that's convenient. <laughs> you just dumped a couple of thousand dollars on a cable that has a battery with a little LED with the idea that it keeps your cable always broken in. Well, maybe you can stick some Christmas lights to the uh, battery as well and just make it look real good, you know? <laughs> I did have an idea to come up with a translucent cable, and, uh, you know, if there are any cable vendors out there, I'd be happy to go into business with you on that. <laughs> oh my goodness, that's great, Gene. You know, and I, th I, th again, I think the point to hammer home is the fact that the, the the skin effect problem is really a myth for frequencies that you can go ahead and hear. Yeah, you know? well, frequencies that the equipment is operating at, and you know, there are some of these skin effect free cables. Yeah, they do have a, a more linear resistive and inductive profile in the audio band. You can measure it. You know, measurement equipment is thousands of times more sensitive and consistent than the human ear. But the interesting thing about this, Hugo, is you can take a regular piece of 10-gauge zip cord from Blue Jeans again, or anybody makes it, Monoprice, whatever. This cable actually has lower AC resistance and especially DC resistance than some of these so-called skin effect-free cables, up to 100 kilohertz, which is mm -hmm. almost a decade past the audio band. 
So even though you're coming up with these skin effect free cables, a lot of them are using high conductor, ca high gauge cables, high gauge um, conductors. Mm -hmm. And that's not what you want with cables. With cables, you want the lowest DC resistance possible because you want to minimize what's called insertion loss. Mm. So I typically recommend, you know, for high-end audio applications, for short runs, 12 gauge cables fine, for longer runs, uh, 10 gauge. We actually have a chart on our website, and you could link it up in the video, that basically tells you, based on the run of your cable, the length of your cable, and based on the impedance of your speaker, whether it's an 8 ohm nominal or 4 ohm nominal, here's the kind of gauge cable you should be running to minimize what I call insertion loss. And you can read more about that. I don't want to get too technical in this video. But the bottom line with speaker cables is the most important metric is resistance. As the board would say, resistance is futile. Resistance is futile, <laughs> exactly. So for longer runs, 10 gauge, and then for more shorter runs, 12, correct? Yes, and you know, you could go higher. I mean, I, 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 cable is so cheap. I mean, I've got a standard piece of zip cord right here from Home Depot. I use it as a test lead when I measure amplifiers. This is 12 gauge cable, and I believe you can buy it at Home Depot probably for you know, 50 cents a foot or less. You can get a whole spool of it for about 30 or 40 bucks. And this is good, good enough for most applications. Okay. I also recommend 14.4 if you're running them through walls, because 14.4 conductor cable, I like that idea because the cable's more workable and it's easier to terminate. And mm -hmm. by using 14.4, which is four conductors, you have redundancy in case two of the conductors break, but also by paralleling two conductors that are equal in gauge, it drops at three gauge. Uh -huh. So that 14 gauge cable now becomes an 11 that, gauge 11. cable, mm -hmm. which is close to 10 gauge resistance. Again, resistance, the most important mm -hmm. metric in speaker cables. Excellent. Anything else you want to go ahead and add about this uh, whole subject of the kind of uh, <laughs> pseudoscience that is running around in this industry? Yeah, you know, here's what I recommend to people. Um, take everything manufacturers say with a grain of salt. If they say that measurements don't matter and they claim that they're solving engineering problems that can't be quantified, then you know they're, you're basically dealing with a used, a used car salesman. Yeah. Because how could you identify a problem that allegedly exists if you can't identify a solution to how to fix it? And you can't measure it. And you can't measure it, <laughs> which is ridiculous. So you don't have to be an engineer. You just have to use some common sense here. Yes. And then the other thing you have to worry about is when you see a, a so-called professional review, and usually in the print magazines when they talk about how this cable brought out the chocolatey mid-range in their speakers, or their wife can hear it while they were cooking breakfast in the other room, then you kind of have to take that with a grain of salt too because what I always say, my mantra in Audiholics is well-designed, well-engineered cables are sonically indistinguishable from each other. Meaning that if one cable is good, the other cable is good, it measures good, you're not going to hear a difference. It's only the cables that are deliberately designed badly that could potentially cause a sonic difference in your system. Interesting. Well, thank you so much, Gene. People, you heard the man uh, you've had over here a whole bunch of knowledge that he has dropped today about uh, the myth about uh, cables. And we would like to invite you to go ahead and visit uh, audioholics.com where you can find tons of articles that go ahead and just really pursue the truth about audio. I mean, you're not going to find any kind of BS in this site. Uh, and furthermore, you can also sign up to the Audioholics newsletter where you'll be able to get the newsletter at least once a week and you get like any sort of new article that is uploaded, new videos, and tons more. And for doing so, you also get a free um, top picks this year for of the 2014 picks, right, Gene? We're excited about that. We just released our 2014 top AV gear picks, and they are hot products in there. They don't cost you an arm and a leg, but they're based on what we've reviewed and what we've looked at. And, yeah, I think it's a great read for anyone that's looking to buy new gear this year. Awesome. Well... That's it for today, and again, thank you for uh, taking a look at this video. Feel free to go ahead and rate and comment uh, and share with uh, your friends via social media. And uh, until next time, I'm Hugo Rivera. And I'm Gene Della Sala. And keep listening. <laughs>